the, the, so the, the, ne the next talk is about uh, building uh, service, service business around open source. Hi everyone, my name is Cameron Beatty. I'm the founder of a company called Conversant, which is a virtual phone system provider. Um, my background is in uh, ERP and process um, change, change management, that type of thing, so consulting really. Um, and when I came back from overseas in 2004, um, I decided that I didn't want to be selling my time anymore. So a little bit like the previous um, speaker, we're starting to look at how you productize things. How do you stop selling your time because you've only got so many hours in the day? And um, you run out of time very quickly, um, particularly when you have kids. So how can you um, build a business that um, doesn't require you to be there all the time in order to earn money? So, the Pet Shop Boys, who has ever not heard a Pet Shop Boys song? Fairly well known. They released a tongue-in-cheek song called um, Let's Make Lots of Money in 1985 and no one really heard it. Got to 116 in the UK charts and uh, that was it. A year later that song went to number 10 in the US and number 11 in the UK. Pet Shop Boys went on to sell 50 million records. So what does that tell us? Um, I don't know, it tells us that the market has to be ready for things. Uh, marketing is important. That you have to be prepared for a long game. If you're starting a business and looking for overnight success, then you may be lucky, but probably not. And don't underestimate um, marketing. Um, it's not just about building something and um, people knowing about it. So, um, so we're talking about the business of open source, making something wholesome and good and nice and um, starting to look at money which tends to be nasty and horrible and turn people into uh, different people. So um, maybe there's a, a path through that for all of us. Um, and from my point of view, um, there's a couple of trends which are kind of interesting. One is a move towards open source and the other is a move towards services and maybe the two of them can come together and um, in fact I think there are a lot of examples where we can see that happening right now. So if you look purely at an open source um, software business, um, writing some open source software and trying to make some money out of that, um, there's some fairly well established ways of doing that and then there's some others that may be successful, maybe not and, and the models are changing all the time. Um, license revenue is, is a, a common one where you might have, you might give away the software but you know for the big corporates who want some sort of indemnity or they want stability or some special features um, you might be able to charge for that. Um, and that's probably um, the area that's growing the most that I see, um, which is um, commercial open source, the so-called commercial open source. Um, support subscription revenue, so you can try to get some, um, some people to pay you because you're the, you're the person who knows the most about that bit of software. Um, or you can do some consulting, so you can go in and implement it, find out what people want and, and uh, get your revenue that way. Hardware revenue, which is maybe you um, put your bit of software onto some hardware or a, you know, a toaster or appliance, that type of thing, and, and you charge for the hardware. Or you could get some advertising from um, you know, putting some ads on your website and trying to get as many people onto your website as possible by giving away the software and then tell it, selling t-shirts or, uh, or cup holders or something like that. So those are some of the um, ways that maybe you can make some, some money from um, open source. So the people in this room who, who are using one of those types of uh, models for, for generating revenue. 
some of you. Others have a, a different formula. Um, so one, one trend which I guess because you're here you've picked up on is the move towards open source away from commercial. Even guys like Microsoft are saying that they're uh, you know, open source these days. So you know, you know something's going wrong um, when those guys are uh, jumping on the bandwagon. Um, on the other hand, we have this trend towards software as a service. Um, I started in a so-called application service provider back in 1999, um, which is you know, now turned into software as a service. So this idea of having some software um, that is delivered and managed remotely by somebody else. Um, so there's one, one se sector, I guess, is um, enterprise application software, um, ranging from things like uh, Microsoft Exchange through to CRM software like Salesforce, for example. Uh, now we've got office suites from people like Google, um, Zoho, ERP, Microsoft's in there, Cashflow Zero, a New Zealand company, uh, supply chain management, HR. So there's lots of uh, companies now um, who are either trying to turn their software into um, a service business or they're offer offering um, the two in parallel or their startups, um, for example, Zero, who have said, let's build an application specifically targeted um, not to sell software but to sell a, a recurring um, revenue stream, generate a recurring revenue stream. So there's, there's lots of other services out there as well, whether it's travel expense management. There's, there's a, um, a New Zealand company who does very well in that space, um, and it's called Circo and so on. So there's, there's this trend towards um, software as a service, and in fact, um, the forecasts by Gartner and all these other people are basically saying software as a service is going to grow faster than traditional software sales. So the forecast from 2008 to 2009 in this market is about an 18% increase in the software growth versus about half that for normal software. So it's not to say that everyone's jumping on the bandwagon very quickly, you know, this has been going on for a decade, but there's definitely a trend towards um, buying services rather than buying software. By the way, feel free to fire any questions at me anytime. So we take those two trends and say, okay, so we want to build a business. What do you need to do to build a business? Well, according to Michael Porter, you have either a, a cost advantage or a differentiation advantage. So in order to keep making, keep, keep being profitable over time, you need to have some sort of competitive advantage. Michael Porter's the guy who came to New Zealand and uh, you know, tried to fix all our problems back in the 90s. Um, so, are you in the business of selling software? Well, as we heard earlier today, actually you're not. You're trying to retain customers. You're trying to meet a customer need. So um, how are you going to do that? You're either going to um, give something to people that's the same and cheaper than what they can get elsewhere, or else you're going to give them something better. Maybe you can do both, but generally, um, you're better to focus on one or the other. At least that's what the academics would say. So if you want to create a service business, um, what are your options? You can build it or you can buy it. Now you can't always buy it because maybe the service business that you want to deliver is, is completely unique. Um, but maybe you can buy it. We're in telecommunications, you can go out and uh, go to Broadsoft and pay a million bucks and you can get a, um, a hosted whatever you want and you know, then they'll charge you um, ongoing license fees for every little feature you want to do. Um, alternatively, you can do what we did, which is to build that. Um, if you build it, it'll probably take you longer. And that may be a problem because um, the opportunity may have gone. Um, but if you build it, you can differentiate, differentiate yourself, whereas if you buy it, it's much harder to do that. 
So, for example, the, um, the ASP that I started um, in the UK in the late 90s, we were just uh, hosting Microsoft Exchange, and that's fine until someone else does that, and then how do you differentiate yourself? You either have to do it on service, which people actually don't believe. Um, people don't generally believe it when you go to say to them, um, we offer a better service than the other guys. Um, or you differentiate yourself on price. And um, that can end in tears. Um, if you build it, then you have people who have a better product knowledge than if you buy it. And for me, that's um, a very important um, differentiator because um, when people call you up and have a problem, if you've got the people who um, built the product helping those people, you may not want them answering the phone because um, you know, those type of people may not necessarily be very good with customers. But if you have them very close to your customers, then you are able to find out very, very quickly what the pain points are that those customers are having, what customers are asking, and you can feed that straight back into your product development. And that will lead to you having a better um, product. If you've bought the product, you're just going to refer all those hard questions off to the supplier and then you have to go through the support loop. If you build it, it may be cheaper or it may not. Um, if you build it yourself and you don't have many customers, then it's going to be expensive. Um, if you build it yourself and you get a lot of customers and you're not having to pay license fees, then it's going to work out cheaper and much more profitable. The other thing about buying is that any extra features typically cost. If you buy some product and you want the enterprise version or the one that does call recording or the one that does this, that and the next thing, that's an add-on feature. And, and so then you have to say, okay, well can I really afford the hundred grand up front for that fee and then the ongoing license charges per user? Um, so that comes back to the differentiation. If we can offer that, um, those add-on services by building those, and we're not having to pay lots and lots of license fees, then we can, we can offer a better service to our customers. Um, the dif another difference is that you end up with more staff if you build it yourself, unless you contract out that to uh, external people, if you trust external people to do your, um, your development. Um, Whereas with the buy option, you're going to be you're going to be spending more on license costs. You'll have less staff. All things being equal. So who are these companies? These are companies who are out there right now, offering services built on open source software. Um, there's a number of them and these are all um, significant players in the, in, the, in the marketplace. Zoho does, um, anyone heard of Zoho? Zoho's like a Google, Google Apps type competitor. Um, built on CentOS, MySQL, Tomcat, Hadoop, Google Gears. Um, Amazon Web Services, anyone use Amazon Web Services here? One. Um, I'd say in a few years there'll be a lot more people using that type of service because it is really, it is really amazing. And um, if, if you take one piece of advice away, I would say um, anything you build, you should build um, with the cloud so-called in mind. Forget, forget the other way of building things where you assume that everything's on a machine or physically closely um, associated with each other. Forget that. Pretend that everything can be separated out and has to be um, effectively messages between them. But that, that stuff um, with Amazon is built um, using Linux and Zen basically. So, um, you know, 
Amazon Web Services is, is pretty cool. Um, right now, which is a sort of a CRM product used by large corporates like Vodafone, um, again built using Linux, Apache, MySQL, Facebook, um, runs on the LAMP platform, Yahoo, Google, um, all run very, very large service-based businesses running on open source software. So it can be done, and if those guys are doing it, and there's some big names there, then it's a smart thing to do. So we built um, an open source um, telephony company um, using primarily those first two um, bits of software, which is Asterisk, well known. Um, 2008, 16% of new lines sold in the US, in other words, PABX sales in the US was Asterisk. So that's pretty phenomenal, um, which is about the same size as the biggest other um, PABX provider, which is Nortel. And we all know the, uh, well, I don't know if you know, but or Nortel had some serious financial issues uh, recently. So, you know, it's having a big impact. Um, Camaleo, which is a SIP proxy, um, is a company in Germany called One and One. They process one billion minutes per month using Camaleo, which is uh, basically shifting calls around. So, these are not toys. These are extremely um, valuable pieces of software that in the past you would have had to pay huge money for and it's free. The, those two products are GPL licensed. A Dempierre, which is um, uh, the accounting and billing system we use, um, is open source um, software written by a, an ex-SAP guy. So it, um, it's very well architected and um, it, it scales well and it handles multi-tenants and, and all the other good things that I'll talk about in a minute um, that you should try to be thinking about when you're writing your software. Um, Apache ODE, which is a um, orchestration um, engine which basically um, makes sure processes happen in a particular order. Um, MySQL needs no introduction, um, and then various other bits and pieces, including Drupal and Argios and so on. So all those free bits of uh, software together, unfortunately, with Oracle Database, but um, we will be removing that, um, is what we use to um, provide a host of PABX and um, ISP, well, not ISP, but um, telco type services hosted, we also do a hosted, um, a DMPA or a hosted accounting, accounting and billing system. So um, it can be done and the advantage of um, open, using the open source build it yourself approach is what I was talking about before, you have a better product differentiation and you can do it for a better price. So the things I guess I'd like you to think about is firstly if you're in the business of writing software or you're thinking of starting a software business or maybe even a consulting business around open source software that you should think about services. Don't just think about selling licenses or just about selling support contracts. Think about turning something into a product or a service that people will pay for on a recurring basis. If you're selling licenses, you have to sell it again and again and again. It's like selling bottles of water. Once you've sold it once, the person's gone, that's it. If you're selling recurring, if you're selling services and there's a recurring revenue stream there and you don't have to sell again and again. And what we've found, what I've found, is that once you get a customer, if you treat that customer well, if you give them a good service, then they will stay a customer for a long time. And you don't need contracts for that. You don't need to sign up for two years like you know most of the telcos do because they give such crap service that they need to lock you in for two years so that when the two years comes around, then they have the next 
special deal to lock you in for another period of time, which builds resentment. Actually, if you uh, treat your customers well, they'll stay with you. And once you've done that initial effort, you'll get that long revenue stream over a long period of time. The other thing to think about is um, when you write your software, think about multi-tenant. How can you slice up? How can you write your software so it can be sliced up and sold to multiple different customers? So don't just write it assuming that there's only going to be one business or one entity running that bit of software. Make sure that you can run it, that software sliced up multiple companies so you can serve 5, 10, 50, 100 customers off that one installation. Multi-currency, multi-language. Generally, um, most software, open source software particularly, is very good at multi-language, um, multi-currency. Just think about, if I had to take this bit of software and use it in a services business, would it work? If you're starting a services business, think about um, using open source software rather than proprietary software or buying a system. Um, you'll get better differentiation, differentiation and you'll be able to give the products, the, deliver the services at a better price, I think. That's it. Any questions? Uh, hosting a DMPA, what do you find the issues are in, in hosting that application? Hosting a, a DMPA, the ERP. What are the issues with hosting a DMPA? Um, um, the access to the because the application was written really as with a Java Swing client as the primary client for it, um, and that's horrible over, um, it's extremely chatty and it doesn't work basically over the internet. Um, so we have to use the, the ZK, ZK client, um, and Chrome is by far and away the best browser for the use of that. Um, we found Internet Explorer and, and Firefox um, pretty, pretty ordinary. Um, so that's probably the main, the main issue is, um, um, is getting Internet-based access to that application. So as I say, we use um, the ZK client. Um, the other thing, we actually use Oracle um, as the database back end to a DMP year um, and it really only works with Oracle or um, um, PostgreSQL so we just haven't made the leap to um, PostgreSQL really to, to um, have yet another database to run so um, those are probably the only things I can think about But Adempi is good. It's not the most user-friendly product, but um, it's very, very powerful. I want, wanted to ask your um, thoughts on um, on this, um, basically selling your time versus building up um, building up a service that you that you yep. you know that you're going to sell. Um, I mean, um, the risk. If, you know, it seems that you're advocating building up some kind of a service that, that you can then sell to customers, but the risk of that is that someone then can come in with a similar uh, service and, and undercut you or, um, you know, just do a better, you know, you spend a year, say, in development or, or, or five years or whatever, and then something else comes comes along and, and supersedes it. So what are your thoughts yeah, on you Yeah, don't, you don't, if you, if you think about services, they can range in a very broad 
range from, you know, one end of the extreme like Google or Facebook or some, you know, massive thing like that through to something that you can tack on to your consulting business. Um, and, you know, maybe that is um, reselling hosting, you know. Maybe that's what you're doing. Maybe you're, you, you develop your own um, hosting business that is targeted at a particular vertical market, whatever your um, specialty. Or maybe maybe it's a geographic region, you know, maybe you can be the expert poster in a particular region where um, what I'm advocating is trying to get an ongoing revenue stream that doesn't require you to be there. So you're here, you're probably not earning any money. Mm -hmm. I'm here, I'm earning money because there's people making calls right now. And that, if you can, if you can think about that, how can you, as part of your consulting business or whatever you do, take a, get a, identify a niche or some sort of um, product. Maybe it's maybe it's a kit, like like was just talked about. You know, coming coming up with some sort of kit that helps businesses do whatever it is that that. Um, that you provide, instead of having to pay you for five hours, they buy the kit for $150 or something like that. I don't know. But so it's not necessarily, your services is not, not necessarily software as a service. I'm more talking about trying to productize something that you can sell repeatedly. Just something to think about. Is your infrastructure based in New Zealand, or do you have your servers elsewhere? And the reason I ask that is, are you satisfied with the costs and the availability of services, of bandwidth and, and rack space and whatnot in New Zealand? Uh, the short answer is no um, to both those questions. Um, so we have servers that are um, Obviously with a real-time service, certain things have to be close to the customer and other things can be further away. So, you know, basically with a call, you've got the signaling and the audio. So the signaling actually is in the US um, and uh, because that's pretty cheap. Um, but the media has to be handled in New Zealand. So um, whatever we can, we move offshore. So, you know, all our monitoring... Um, you know, the website, the accounting, the billing, all that type of stuff, that's in the US. Um, and the media is in New Zealand. So. This, this is probably too specific, but <laughs> are, your, are your VoIP servers in New Zealand? The, the VoIP servers themselves? The, the signaling is yeah. in the US. Your asterisk servers. The asterisk servers are in New Zealand. Right. And, and are you satisfied with the quality of the SIP connections you get? Uh, yes, well, I'm satisfied with the quality of the SIP connections we get. Um, I'm less satisfied about the quality that our customers get, in the mm. sense that what they have to pay for um, internet connections is, is too dear, but what are you going to do? You know, that's, that's just a general problem with New Zealand. Um, so yeah, I'd like I'd like better better than ADSL services, but most of our customers use ADSL, and um, you know they they trade off between the quality that you get with an ADSL connection, which is fine most of the time until it's not, um, and others like call centres they have better connections, whether it's fibre or SHDSL or something like that. So. Um, it's a it's a it's a price trade off. I would just like better internet connections for the same price. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.